second how you doing tonight partner i'm doing great mark how are you i'm doing good looks like i'm still trying to struggle with learning this new yard dog (laughs) so we're going to get a little help tonight and uh but man we're we're going out this weekend we're going to do a little camping this weekend aren't we yes we are so, we're wasting our time, but we're going, ain't we? Yeah. <laughs> Man, I tell you, we've got some exciting film footage to show tonight. And we are going to go to the man that filmed it. And yep. we're going to find out more about that. We're going to find out about his business. And we have a link in at the top of the comment section if you're interested in checking it out. And if you have questions tonight, we're, uh, Larry's going to cue everybody when to start asking the questions. And we are going to try to pull them up on this new yard dog. So <laughs> we'll ask for y'all to save them towards the end of the end of the show and so why don't you introduce our co-host for tonight larry our co-host is our attorney for an upcoming defamation suit his name is scott espinosa how you doing scott come on the board <laughs> <laughs> i'm on i'm on i uh <laughs> Almost wasn't there for a second. I had to re refresh there. You thought you were just co hosting tonight. You didn't know you're gonna to get the lawyer up too, did you? Well I, I since I didn't hear what uh my intro was, I guess I can't be held responsible for <laughs> what exactly uh any responsibilities were uh, put on me from Larry uh, or Mark. <clears throat> but well, uh, no, it's good to be here. Great, great to be here actually. We We are glad that you are our new attorney at law, but we are more glad that we got to meet you and spend time with you. And we are just, you're just a great guy. And so we're, we're thrilled about that. Well, I wish I could join you guys this weekend. That's for sure. I mean, the feeling's mutual. Um, Getting out there um, where you guys are going and seeing a couple different places that uh, I wanted to go back or didn't have a chance to get to when we were out there. So, uh, yeah, I'll be interested to see what what it's like. And maybe I can, like we had talked about earlier, get out there maybe in February, maybe maybe January. Sometimes where um, hopefully there's no uh, travel issues, rain or whatever else may be there that sounds great (laughs) sounds great well i'm gonna go ahead and sign off here and let y'all get our guest on all right tonight our guest is all the way from south florida his name is david sheely he taped the skunk ape video about 20 years ago coming up in july i believe david how are you doing tonight Good, good. It's a little. It's been a little chilly the last few days down here in the Everglades, so I'm, you know, still a little cold in the bone, but I'm warming up. It's warming up a little bit. Well, that's good. 
as long as them Burmese pythons don't get out moving. Uh, yeah, I, I spent the first part of the day um, taking care of my pythons. I'm, uh, I'm, they're they're an exotic species, and and you may have seen some of the shows on TV where they're catching them in the Everglades. Yeah, and I'm behind the scenes on. Uh, Guardians of the Glades with Dusty Crumb is one of the shows that, that runs. He's, he's a friend of mine. He actually lived with me for the last five months. But because I carry such high permits, uh, it's required in filming in the National Park and a lot of regulations. I actually own the second largest python in the world in captivity. Uh, it's 23 feet long, weighs 300 pounds. Some people may wow. have seen it in December on Discovery. I had it measured by... Ripley's in the Guinness Book of World Records. So I, I was working with my snakes this morning, and you know, I keep them warm. I had a few heaters going. I don't like them <laughs> to get below 70 degrees. I try to keep them between 70 and 90. Yeah. And they're well, used on a, a lot of television shows, uh, bringing public awareness to the situation we have down here. Yeah, well, that's cool. Uh, David, could you introduce yourself to the audience and tell them a little bit about yourself and your your research headquarters there in Florida. Well, I'm, my name's Dave Shealy, and I was born and raised in the Everglades. I'm 57 years old. Uh, my father uh, was a skunk ape researcher uh, before me, not but not quite uh, as, as, as famous or, you know, well-known as what I have because I went public with it. For my dad, it was more of a personal thing, and him and his buddies would get together and of course, there wasn't the media, the social media. And, you yeah. know, you did, you did, you, the only time television came to the Everglades, maybe it was a, a major motion picture for a day. But today, you know, there, there's television shows and stuff. So just naturally, it kind of spread a little bit. Before, it was more of a, a, a local Everglades thing. But my family moved to the Everglades in 1890. Um, we lived on the coast in the 10,000 Islands. And, and it was it was kind of the the end of the trail. Um, the only thing in the Everglades at that time were were Indians and outlaws, and and <laughs> I guess my family would be on the you know on the outlaw side. Uh, um, we but you you would think so, but we actually um, moved there from Central Florida to build a school and bring and educate um, the few islanders that lived in the ten thousand islands of Everglades National Park and. And so I grew up in, in the Everglades. Uh, my father grew up in the Everglades. And my son is now who's running my business. He, he was born and raised there as well. Um, I actually um, don't live in Everglades National Park. I live on the northern border of the park um, in a 900,000 900, acre area. It's called the Big Cypress National Preserve. And um, it, it's a, uh, it's not uh, the, the national park is more of an estuary and aquatic type thing in the ten thousand islands. And as you come inland, the the elevation begins to rise, and you get into the mammals, the black bears, the panthers. And that's where I live, and and it, it's an area that was set aside as a buffer zone for the national park. It's a, it's a huge area that together. Um, that, that where I live is the largest protected wild area east of the Mississippi. It's a three million acres, uh, and I pretty much live in the heart of it. Yeah, that's cool, no doubt. And that's uh, my family is is also recognized uh, uh, by the Corps of Army Engineers as as a culture. It's called the Gladesman culture, and mm -hmm. um, so I I grew up, and I guess if, if I would be what you call a gladesman, and that, that's what my culture is. Can you explain a little bit of that culture as a, of a gladesman? Well, um, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a survivalist culture. I mean, <laughs> it, it was a tough area. Um, the, yeah. the Seminole Indians, who are my friends and neighbors, um, they're the only Indian tribe in the United States of America that was never defeated and never surrendered. Um, the last battles took place very, very near where I live now. Um, and, um, and, and like them, my family, um, 
Uh, you do what you you got to kind of coexist with nature, and, and you do what you got to do to survive. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you live off the land. Um, you get around different than other people do. We use pole skiffs, which were um, the Indians had dugout canoes, and um, but we would use lumber and build uh, pretty much square boats with a long stick. And and uh, my son. Um, we, we have five guides that live on my property who are licensed by the National Park, and we do pole skiff tours in the Everglades in the National Park, which is, you know, once again, very regulated, and, and it's a one-of-a-kind business. We're the only people that do it. Yeah. That's pretty neat. I know you mentioned that your father, he was also into the skunk ape and probably gave you a heads up on a lot of stuff at an early age. How many encounters did he have? Do you have a general idea? Well, um, my father unfortunately died relatively young, and uh, so we never really got to have the long campfire conversations uh, okay. as adults. So I wish we had. But um, when I was young, um, not 1961, when we when he purchased the property where I live now. Uh, and, and I do live in the National Park, which is, I, I got a really unique piece of land. You can't buy land in a National Park, but we bought right. before it was uh, acquired, the, the surrounding area. Um, I remember when, as, as far back as I can remember, the skunk ape was a topic of conversation with him and his friends uh, at the dinner table, around campfires, at, at uh, social events. With, a social event would be somebody catching a bunch of fish and having a fish fry. That would be a social right. event. And, um, you know, dinner around the table would uh, be, be a few friends come over. And I remember um, we had a fluorescent bulb, when a, just a fluorescent light. But you got to understand, I mean, that was high tech stuff. And it was, and we had a plate glass window uh, looking out over the glades with this fluorescent bulb. And, and um, the bugs would come by the thousands and land on the glass. And then the, the yeah. green tree frogs would come and eat them. So TV, that was our TV. We'd <laughs> have dinner and watch the frogs eat the bugs. And, you know, it was, it was pretty, pretty crude. Um, but the, the conversation turned to Skunk Ape uh, a lot when his friends would come over. Um, my dad was a machinist. Uh, he worked on equipment. Uh, heavy equipment and stuff like that and and he was he was a, a real smart fella and, and his buddies owned airboats and stuff so if they needed work on the airboats they'd bring it over my dad would work on it well skunk ape would come up but i remember um the first time i actually ever saw real evidence is um we we went uh we, we were coming home onto the road to our place and we had a chain across the road it wasn't a tall chain it was kind of a low slung chain yeah. and um my dad got out to take the lock off and next thing i know he came back to the car and he got my mom out and he walked out there and were pointing something on the ground and i remember you know well, what are you looking at i was i was a curious kid i love to catch snakes and stuff and put them in my pockets and little yeah. snakes and ribbon snakes and <laughs> so I got out and I ran around there and he was pointing at these big tracks in the mud on the edge of the road there where the gate was. And I got to looking and I remember them to this day. Um, they were just, it, it was, um, they were skunk ape tracks. The skunk ape had been, I guess, walking down the road or something. It came to the chain and just went ahead, just walked right around it as opposed to going over it, I guess. And uh, so that was my first actual seeing the evidence. I'd heard them talking about it. Yeah. And I'm assuming that was before I was 10 years old. But when I was 10 years old, um, I was out hunting with my brother Jack and we actually saw a skunk ape on the grasses behind our property. We were out hunting. And uh, that, that was interesting. My, my brother um, saw it at first and I couldn't see it because the grass is pretty high out there. I'm 10 years old and and so he had to pick me up and he picked me up to where I could look out over the grass and maybe a hundred yards away is when I saw my first skunk ape. And it, it was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, it's like a man covered with air, uh, um, not, not a bear, not, not with the Roman nose and, and 
even though bears ears are relatively small when you see a bear they they stick out pretty wide and it didn't have the ears it didn't have that canine type nose it was a rounded head uh, moving slowly and my brother and i just took off running back to the house and we we had a gun we were hunting but we were just kind of brought up if, you, if you're going to shoot something you're going to eat it and, um, right. I'm, yeah, I'm assuming we didn't want to eat that thing <laughs> i understand that how far away was that from your house um wasn't that far maybe a half a mile from my house just on out the back of the property we kind of had a little rule where if we killed a deer early in the morning and uh, we didn't have to go to school because we had to dress it out, we had to get meat in the refrigerator. And so it was kind of a free school day. We didn't kill a lot of deer, but you know, we always tried real hard because we weren't <laughs> big on going to school. Right. <laughs> Did you ever have any, uh, any of the uh, skunk apes come up around your property or mess around with your, your, your house where you were living or anything like that? Uh, I, I have no doubt that they've been on the property. Um, a matter of fact, uh, just day before yesterday, I walked out my front door and, and there was a bear standing at the bottom of my steps. And I have panthers and cougars. I, I, I live in the Everglades. When I walk out of my door, anything that lives in the Everglades can be in my yard at any time. I have several alligators and stuff like that around. But um there, there, there was one time I see, I also, my, my, my property's quite large. I have a 150 campsites on it. I have a, I have a campground and uh, I don't want you to confuse that with being a trailer park with a bunch of clothes lines and old washing machines. I, I run a, a first, first class operation. It's like a state park It's uh, open areas. I don't have people living there permanently. I, two week uh, maximum stay. I keep it fluid. It just keeps the place nicer. People come right. and go have a good time. I like that. I don't want to. So, but I had some customers in, oh, I don't know, 16 years ago or so. And, and, um, they, they swore up and down that, um, and this is something you might find interesting that they, they had had a campfire going for quite some time. I parked them just after dark and they said, uh, the, 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 uh, while they were sitting there at the campfire, they heard something up in the tree next to where their fire was. And they said it climbed down the tree and stood up next to the fire and said it was about four feet tall. And, and they said it looked like a, a chimpanzee or a monkey. And, hmm. um, and, uh, so yeah, you know, and then, and then the tracks that we found on the property. So I, I'm there, everything in the Everglades is, is at my place. At any any time, could be there right now. I don't know. Yeah. I, I put some. Uh, I, I had linguine and clam sauce last night, and despite <laughs> knowing better, I dumped it in the middle of my campfire when I left. I'm not at home right now, but <laughs> you never know what's digging around out there. And yeah. I want to talk a little bit about this. You know, since since it did come up, um, you know that they saw this this skunk ape. It was small. Um, walking uh, two legs uh, upright, um, they described it as looking chimp-like. And just yesterday, I, I get a lot of people in my facility. Um, I get a hundred plus people a day. Some days up to maybe four hundred people. It's 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 a, it's a lot. I, I keep I, I've got a busy parking lot, and um, those people are out visiting the Everglades. Yeah. Well, yesterday this fella comes in, and um, the, the highway in front of my place runs between Naples, Florida, and Miami, Florida. It's called Highway 41. It's a road down through the Everglades at the bottom of the state. It crosses the state. A lot of history it's called the Tamiami Trail. He says, I've come by this place several times. And he said, I look over here, and he said, I see, see it. And he said, but I just never believed it. He said, I never believed it. He said, but... He said, I was, I was um, up on the road here. Um, he said, just a couple days prior, he had a couple friends with him. And he said, he saw um, a skunk ape and he wanted to talk to me about it. And I said, well, tell me about it. What did you see? And um, he said, it crossed the road in front of him. And he said that 
everybody in the truck was a swart was a chimpanzee because it was only like you know maybe four feet tall large chimpanzee he said it was walking on two legs and that his arms were a little bit longer than like a human's would be it appeared and and they said it was pretty quick sighting but long enough for them to know it wasn't a bear or a wild boar or you know yeah. somebody in a gorilla suit it was an actual an animal and um and then about well, this is maybe four years ago i I do canoe and kayak rentals. Like if you come down to the Everglades and you want to rent canoe and kayak, I got a crew that'll take kayaks and canoes down to the river and drop them off. And then when you're done, you call us and wherever you're at, we come pick up the boats and bring it back, whatever you need. Yeah. But I, these two doctors came in from Naples, Florida. This is maybe five years ago. Older men, retired. I'm they just wanted to go canoe and they weren't there to learn about skunk apes or anything. I didn't want to hear about that. I, I don't guess. I don't know. I didn't talk to them. But they rented the canoes. We put them in and they came back and they came in the store. And um, after after we picked up their boats and all, they came back and they wanted to talk to me. And they said, we just wanted to let you know. They kind of said it in me. We just wanted to let you know we saw two of those skunk apes standing on the edge of the river down there when we were in the boat. We just figured we'd let you know. Yeah. And I was surprised. And I said, well, hold on a minute. You know, well, what did you see? And they said that they were paddling down the river and, and on the bank, just plain as day, that there was um, a skunk ape standing there. And I said, they said there were two of them. And, you know, they came back. They've been coming back 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 all the time and I, I wanted to get them on television it's very credible but i just i'm i just haven't done it yet and uh but they actually said they saw three but my i always thought they saw two but they told me this last time but they said it was standing on the edge of the bank and i said well what did it look like and they said well it's about four or five feet tall and they said it looked like a monkey or a chimp or something and there was another one with it and yesterday they told me that there was actually something else off, but they said they were small animals. And, um, but that's not what I photographed. I, I, the, what I photographed was six and a half to seven feet tall. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the film. Yeah. Um, and, uh, definitely, uh, not a chimpanzee, or, or anything like that. Now, um, Day before yesterday, the head of the National Park Service, who I, I've had uh, disagreements, you know, being a gladesman and, and rules and regulations affect, affecting my culture and my way of life. I, I bumped yeah. heads with, with the park for a long time. I, and uh, I, I've actually, you know, I've, 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 I've actually designed uh, the, the camping facilities in the Everglades that they offer. See, I own a campground, so they're competing business and there's a conflict of interest so i i i it's a, what i do i do i'm a skunk ape hunter but i'm also um have had a lot of input into the the everglades and, and the way that, that their layout is for commercial influx millions of people visit the everglades and there's areas yeah. that are considered culturally significant to the indians and to myself where they wanted to build things i had to fight them on back and forth but actually day before yesterday a lot of times, of the, as I say, a lot of times they give you a hard time if you're uh, talking about skunk apes and Bigfoot and stuff like that. You haven't had any trouble with the Park Service in that way at all? No. Um, well, you know, initially, initially, I've had a lot of different problems, um, but I've never really had a problem in that regard. In fact, um, I'm, I'm leading up to that right now to where what the Park Service is, is actually looking into my research. They've partnered with an orangutan facility in Indonesia and they're bringing in researchers. But day before yesterday, the head of the national park, not the head of the whole country, but the head of Everglades National Park, Big Cypress and all of the federal parks in South Florida came to my facility and spent about three hours um, there at my shop and, and, at, and at my home. It's my son's home now. My son lives there. I, I got a little place in the woods out back. I try to stay away. And I kind of shied away from that meeting because they're always wanting to meet me. And I'm not really big on meeting them. But 
you know, yeah. my son, he's, he's young, he's running the business, he's a player, so he's going to have him over for meetings. Yeah. And um, pretty much, um, so then yesterday, yesterday I'm up there kind of, because I'm, uh, I'm out, of, I'm, I'm, I'm not out too far out of town. I'm, I'm about 80 miles from my house right now visiting my girlfriend we got a couple of voices up wow now but I'm, I'm yesterday kind of preparing to leave them and the head law enforcement um of of the of south florida federal came in with with a couple of people and they then they, they asked and i happened to be there and i talked to them so i um, they wanted to see my tracks and stuff like that and they took some photographs of the castings that i have on display in the shop and um now that they're actually um, very supportive of what I'm doing, and uh, and very encouraging. Uh, it, it, I don't know. Uh, you you may can imagine, but the the, the laws and regulations in, in an environmentally sensitive area like that, as far as where you can go, how you can get there. There's so many laws, and and basically, uh, um, and and not to be abused. Um, you know, I've kind of got kind of got free reign to, to, to go where I want to go and, and by any means necessary. And I don't yeah. have to really um, look over my shoulder, but that doesn't mean I could go destroy things and tear up things. But my, when it comes to my research, um, they, they've really um, opened the door to allow me to get out and do what I need to do. And, and that's taken taken about 10 years for that, to, for that to happen. A lot of work. Yeah. They have they ever closed seen... areas in the Everglades that people don't go to. I don't know if you know that. Sure. Have they ever acknowledged that uh, that they do exist? They are actively looking in to the possibility that there is a small population of primates that do exist that live in the Everglades, or and they are. They are actively trying to document those animals. They get dozens of sightings reported to their visitor centers uh, annually and lots of photographs. And, and I hear it all the time. Well, if there's skunk apes there, how come there isn't any photographs? How come somebody hasn't caught one on a trail cam? And the, the, the answer is people have. I, I've seen several photographs taken with trail cams cams that are, that are inexplicably uh, a primate animal over four or five feet tall and standing upright on two legs. Yeah. That, uh, there are pictures. Um, and people bring them to me and they think that I can call the local newspaper or the local television station and have them come up and they're going to be on TV with their pictures. Right. But how the media works i i mean i just i i don't have that kind of power to do those kind of things for people and <laughs> and so yeah you know, um i there's not a whole lot i can do other than look at their pictures and, and be amazed and i and i truly yeah. am well let let's get to your video can you give us a little bit of the backstory to how you went to this location and how you filmed this creature and then mark a play the film after you tell the story about it yeah um it i believe it was in july and of 2000 is that it says it right on there yeah yeah it was july 8th of 2000 which that was 20 years ago going on 21 years ago it seems like yesterday to me um it was prior to hunting season our our uh our deer, they were, they're rutting in July. There's a, there's a lot of rutting activity going on. Um, about three quarters of a mile from where that picture is taken, and that's is where my campground is. I have, uh, at the time, I had 50 hunt camps in my campground. So a lot of hunt camps. And I just, I, 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 had, I had a camera, and I, I really wasn't, thinking I would see anything. Normally the, the, the last, before that, I think it was in 97, I got some still photographs. It took me six months. So I knew I was in an area where there were skunk apes, but I was actually looking for deer. And you can see that tree line there with the grass. That's that's not really a tree line. That's an island. That's a, a round hammock. And you're just looking at the edge of it. 
and the hammocks have the palm trees as you can see in the oak trees but in the grasses the water is relatively deep uh, in the brown grass that you're looking at there um, the water's a foot to a foot and a half deep in the month of july and so and you've got to keep that in mind when it comes towards the end of that hammocks and takes off across the field and so i'm walking along and i hear something splashing and um, it's not like um, a, a bear or a panther or anything. It sounds like a person walking, like maybe another hunter. And I looked up and I saw it. Now, it's about a quarter of a mile down the edge of that, that tree line or that hammock. Now, here's where it's crossing the field. Now, as it moves out, the water gets deeper. And right in here, it's almost two foot of water. And you can see it's literally just flying and if it was a white-tailed deer running full speed that would be about what you'd see right there it's it's running incredibly fast and um and so i i took the footage and 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 really the only criticism i've ever gotten about the footage was how come i didn't chase after it and get more footage well once again the water's two foot deep uh, uh, there was no catch in that thing. It was running as fast as a deer when it crossed that field. And But I did go to the hammock that it ran into, and I did cast a track that I have on display in my gift shop. It is a long walk down that edge there. And yeah. and since in the last 20 years, I don't know, I've done a lot of television stuff, and I, I've seen all kinds of ape suits and actors, and they and, and, and it's, it's physically impossible for somebody to cover that much ground in July, which the temperatures are at 100 degrees. And then after covering all of that ground, take off at, a, at, at, a, at this, like a, an Olympic runner across that grass. Um, it, it's just, and, and I've never really had anybody do any real investigation. That's an environmentally sensitive area where you can't you can't go into I, I can't take people there unless permits are obtained from the national park and rangers accompany us to that area and no television shows like finding bigfoot in that they don't have the budget for that kind of stuff they, they so you can't so you, so you can't hunt on over that. you can't hunt over on that 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 piece of property but you're you're setting up there checking out deer you can hunt there. You can hunt oh. there as an individual. But anytime you do something other than that, it's considered a commercial activity. Like if I took a film crew there, it would be considered a commercial activity, and that's not allowed. A lot of laws. Yeah. See it right there? Yeah. Right there. I, it's just, I, it is literally... Um, and I, I and I've actually been out there. I don't know if you've seen my Facebook stuff, but I've been out to that location a couple of times recently. And um, and to this day, I'm just in awe of, of how powerful uh, it, it was and, and, and the strength it had. And see there, that's when I that's just that's just after the first song. And it goes there, and there's a little clump there, and it goes in behind it. And see, that's a big animal. I had some I had some Bigfoot hunters come to my park, and I let them out there and showed them the area. And they did a little bit of stuff, but they didn't have like this the the post to lean up against the tree to get the height and stuff like that. Yeah, I hope they come back. Yeah, it'd be good to see somebody try to reenact it, so you can judge the size and see how much somebody labors to go across there that would be very interesting to see for sure it would be very interesting but it would have to have legally would have to be kept at a scientific level it right. couldn't be put on youtube and people sell advertisements on it it's i'm telling you it's really regulated yeah but yeah, i mean like if, if you guys came down and wanted to take a walk out there I'd be more than happy to take you to the area. Yeah. Um, but anything considered commercial is prohibited. 
So there, is there hike, hiking trails or anything like that out there at all, or is it just pretty much pretty much no. wild? No, not right there. I got a couple swamp buggy trails and an airboat trail that I use. Um, they, there's no activity in that area. 20 years ago, that was closed to motorized vehicles. Yeah, I was and, wondering uh, if it had de developed or changed in the last 20 years, that, that, that certain spot there. No, no, it looks the same today. Uh, it looks just the same today. No different. It doesn't change a whole lot. Those palm trees that you see, um, those are old palm trees. They were that size when I was a kid. They don't grow real fast. They have a slow growth. Whenever I the creature, that. I love watching that. <laughs> when the creature took off running, do you think it sensed you were there, saw you, or did it just do it because it was crossing the opening there? Well. <laughs> I honestly believe that it was, I, I believe it was trailing the deer. I think it, I think it may have been hunting a deer. That was, it was actually on a game trail. And I, I might have, if I, if I misspoke, I'm sorry when you ask about trails, but that is a natural game trail there. It's what I call a corridor. Yeah. Um, even though the water is deep where it crossed that, it's a little shallower there than it is around just a, a few hundred yards away. And the wildlife knows it. They use those a little higher hump of ground to, to get from one hammock to another. So it it was running on a deer trail, possibly tracking a deer. It, it's a, when I photograph when I was photographing it. Now, is, is there any seminal land that's down around that area at all? Um, the whole area I live in is um, is seminal land. Um, it's not a reservation. But they have um, all rights on the land, um, like the, the the wading birds, the ibises, and uh, and the alligators. They still go out and take those for food. They oh, do yeah. have an Indian reservation. Um, there's two types of Indians in the Everglades. There's the Miccosukee Indians and the Seminole Indians. And um, but the the there's Indians that live on the reservation and have for a long time but there's also indians that still when i was young lived in the forest they did they refused to live on the reservation they're called the independents do they have um, any type of uh, uh uh i guess uh knowledge that they had passed on down to you or any type of tradition of the skunk ape within their culture at all well you know that that oh yes the answer is yes um, and um, it's just, it's been a, Indians visit my facility daily. Seminole Indians stop by to say hello, uh, to share food with me. And um, and so I hear all of the stories. I, I was really blessed um, in about 1990, an elder, my mother passed away and an elder Seminole one woman who, who grew up in the preserve, actually in the woods back where I took the near where I took the pictures within a mile of there. Um, she kind of took me in, and for ten years she would visit me almost daily. And uh, they have a two hundred year oral history that they remember. They 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 didn't write things down. They just so sure. if you're talking to an Indian in Everglades, if you can get one to talk to you. You know, you're yeah. like talking to the past if you, if you find one that's traditional. So I heard the stories back 200 years, which was when the, when they were uh, at war. And um, she shared um, her family's history with me over a 10 year period in many, many conversations. And I remember every bit of it. Yeah. Um, she she brought up the, the skunk apes, um, the, the oldest story that I recall that she told me was that when the Seminoles were at war, they were pushed into the Everglades, into the forest, and um, they were they were not, not that many in numbers. Some escaped slaves um, came with them, and um, but they they were outnumbered by the army. By you know, of course they were, um, but they they were in a good hiding spot and. 
one of the scouts had went out and um, he had located a group of skunk apes living on a hammock, much like the one you see where my video is. And he, he came back to where they were, they were hiding or, you know, living, whatever, living, I guess, they were living even if they were hiding it. And he told the group, he said, hey, I, I went out to this and I was out to the, to the east and there's a hammock and there's these huge hairy animals that look like men on it. And so they, they had a discussion at the camp and they decided that they, they wanted him to go back there to where he had seen them and see if he could communicate with them because they felt that if, if they could get to communicate that maybe they would help them fight, that they could let them know soldiers were coming and they, they were bad and they, they could have this, this extra force with him. So the, the Indian went back and he was gone a few days and, and he, he came back and he said he, he went back and he, he tried to communicate, but there was, it was just impossible. They, they didn't speak, they didn't talk. They, there was just no communication whatsoever. And so that, that's one of the oldest stories that was told to me. Um, yeah. but I've, I've heard, you know, just so many and, 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 a lot of them, you know, recent, not just years and years of people talking to me. I've heard so much. I can imagine you've heard a lot of interesting things for sure. If anybody out there has any questions for David, if you will, put them in all caps so Mark can see them and he'll put them up here. But David, have you had any significant encounters since that film was made? Um, well, yeah, I did. I wasn't so lucky to get, um, any, uh, any photographs though, but it was one of, one of my, one of, one of the, for me, it was one of the, the, the best sightings I ever had. Um, I was in a, um, I had, I had went to an area. It was maybe, it was, it was in the Everglades, but it was a palmetto hammock, a saw palmetto. Saw palmettos get these berries on them at a certain time of the year, and they use them for um, cancer treatment. So pharmaceutical companies get illegal immigrants and, and outlaws to go into the forest and, and gather them up, and, they, and uh, they're sold yeah. by the tongue. So I, I, I went to an area where poachers and berry pickers couldn't go. To, I wanted to go somewhere that was undisturbed. And um, so I'm in this huge palmetto area, and and I had heard of some skunk ape sightings, and I just thought it would be interesting just to see what was in there because bears eat those berries, deer eat them. They're, they're real essential for the, for the wildlife. And I had the wind in my face, and I was, I was moving really slow, um, just – kind of easing along the palmettos were about three or four foot high so I could see over them and just ahead of me I saw saw some bushes move and I didn't smell anything which sometimes you, I, they have it's a strong odor you can smell but that day yeah. I didn't and uh, so I'm watching these these palmetto fronds wiggling up ahead of me and I've, I've seen it a thousand times with packs of wild hogs or deer bears so I knew there was something there but Lo and behold, a, and all of a sudden, it just a skunk ape rose up and was like looking around, not at me, but just kind of looking around like it was aware that something was there. But uh, like yeah. I said, the wind was in my face. And that's when I noticed uh, other bushes rustling in the area. And there were two spots where the palmettos were moving around like something was feeding in it. And I caught a glimpse of something dark and and then I guess that since that I was there and it, it has moved away kind of quickly and I just, I, I waited, I didn't want to spook them too hard and uh, I waited a little bit and I tried to move up in, into the area where they went to, but I never was able to locate them again. Yeah. But that was, that was one of the ones because I, you know, I, I had had, I had taken the photographs and I have, I had taken the video, so, uh, you know, I was kind of little, I wasn't seasoned by any means, but I mean, I, I was, I wasn't totally cut off guard and, and I was able to really enjoy the experience of just see it, seeing an animal in the wild and enjoying it for what it was. And, and that was really yes, special. Sir. 
Yes, sir. I agree with that. That's what it's about for sure. Scott, go ahead and read David that question in case he can't see it. He may be able to see it. Yeah, Diane Fowler asks, where do you think they sleep since there's so much water in that area? Well, that that's a good area. That's Captain Steve Swamp Buggy there. Um, that's Captain Steve. Um, <clears throat> one of the most interesting characteristics of the skunk ape and um, where you hear the people that see Bigfoot and stuff, you don't hear about them in the trees, but many of the sightings reported to my facility are of skunk apes up in the trees. They climb trees uh, for food. But they, I've also found these in the, in the boughs of some of the bigger cypress trees in the swamps. I found like bedding areas, like, like an eagle's nest, so to speak, not quite as, as baskety shaped, but more flat. But lots of sticks gathered up and laid out in the, in the boughs of trees and the forks of the limbs. And I believe they actually go up and, and stay in the trees at at and at night when the water's higher during the day whenever because that'll get them out of the bugs and out of the water and keep them dry and mm -hmm. that is one of the things the park service the these uh orangutan researchers have really been after me about is the location of these these bedding areas that i find in the trees mm -hmm. and i'm i'm reluctant to really put them on hot spots where I'm actually working because I know that once they, you know, once, once they get their, their work complete, I'll, I'll probably be left out of it. That's the way that works. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but um, to answer the question, uh, when, the, when the waters are high, they definitely lay up in the boughs of trees and when the water levels are low and we have the dry season, we don't have really, I, we got a little cold temperatures now, but we have wet and dry seasons where, where I am with her right there in that video. That's yeah. during the dry season. And so um, you would look for beds and, and, and stuff piled up on the ground, like uh, yeah. palmetto fronds and stuff like that Yeah. Uh, during the dry season. During the wet season, you'd look more into the trees for bedding material. All right. Jacobo asks, have you heard the rumors of pyramids hidden in the glades? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I've heard about that, the, the pyramids in the glades. And the, the Calusa Indians were mound builders. So I come across a lot of mounds, which you know, they might be 20 or 30 feet high going from nothing up to the top and i guess if you cut all the brush off of them there may be a pyramid shape there so i mean i may have even come across pyramids i have come across huge huge mounds that were definitely made by indians 500 plus years ago um, right. yeah i've heard about the pyramids <laughs> okay go ahead scott i was gonna say david blaylock asks uh, has David ever been to the Pacific Northwest? No, I never have. I, I, I've never been out that way. I'd like to go, but no, this never done it. All right. Have you ever seen or had any reports of the lights seen by folks down there as related to skunk ape activity? That's from Bama Murdoch. Okay. Have I ever seen the lights yeah some people say there are orb lights that are associated with bigfoot they're just wondering if you may have seen anything related to the skunk ape like that no i you know i i i of course the the paranormal researchers and the, the um the ufo um researchers um, they visit my facility as, as well, and yeah. um, I, I live in what's called an a, a internationally uh, accredited dark sky area, meaning there's no light pollution, and it's one of the one of the the best places on Earth to see, look into outer space, and and see things like the like the stars. There's there's billions of them. I'm not exaggerating. Where I live, this 
there's so many stars you couldn't even begin to count. It's just a mat, a maze forever. But I've never seen a UFO, and um, I've seen a lot of strange things in the sky. And and, and um, I, I I do believe that that there there is life out there. And I, and I I don't I'm not saying that I don't believe. I'm just saying I've never seen. But I think what what he's asking is about these orbs that are sometimes explained away by swamp gas igniting uh, right. methane gas or you know sometimes people that, that don't believe in orbs they they come up with a scientific explanation well it was swamp gas well i'm here to tell you that we do have uh, methane gas under the everglades and all you have to do is walk around in a swamp bottom and it'll it'll come up and hit you in the face and if you light a match it'll let, It'll actually it'll fire up. You can you can make fire on the water if you go to the right spot. Um, I I I saw a a ball of light one time when I was in the forest, and it passed by me real rapidly. And I assumed um, it was ball lightning. I don't know if you know what I've heard of ball yeah. lightning. Yes, but sir. instead of coming in the form of a bolt, it came in a ball. And it passed in front of me rather quickly and kind of went through the forest. And so I have seen that. And uh, and then um, I, I, I had some people in the other day and, and, this, and that, that came up and they were telling me about how they were camping and in the woods lit up and all of a sudden it was like daylight. And I I I. I Years ago, I was camping with my cousins. We cooked some boiled legs, and I crawled in the tent. And it was maybe two in the morning, and and my cousins woke me up, and they were like, "Dave, get up, get up! You got to see this!" And I got up and came out of the tent, and it was dark, and they were standing there. And I said, "What do you want me to see?" And they said, <laughs> "They said you missed it." They said, "All of the sudden, the whole camp lit up." They said it was glowing. They said it was just like daylight. You could see perfectly. And, and they said, and then all of a sudden it was gone. So, yeah. I mean, I was there and they told me it happened and I believe it. I mean, they were, they were a little freaked out about it, but yeah. I didn't see it. Right. I well, that. Andy, I was going to say, Andy Jones has a question uh, regarding the skunk apes. Do you see them year round or uh, do you think they've moved very much around that area or are they pretty static in, 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 in one location? They're 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 a, a they're a nomadic hunter gatherer, meaning that they roam and they're hunting and gathering, and they do move to different food sources. So I would say that that no, I don't see them year round in the same area, but they are seen year round throughout the Everglades. Okay. Yeah, they they just travel. Um, and and they'll come and they'll come back. Um, uh, that's one of the one of the reasons I've been fortunate is that I, that I'm there all the time, and that I, that I can go to an area where there's a sighting. If there's a sighting, and and I can kind of pin it down to what I think was going on. If I don't see something right then, I can be prepared. In the following year, I can be in there looking ahead of time, and, right. and I, I get really lucky that way. But like I said, it's a three million acre area um for every mile you go behind my house the elevation the ground drops eight inches so if you walk eight inches behind my house you're eight inches below sea level if you walk two miles you're 16 inches lower the sea level so yeah. it's tapered and and all of the animals migrate accordingly as the water falls the the wildlife moves down more into the Everglades, into the mangroves, and then as the water rises, the animals move back up into the forest and pines, and and that's a it's a huge area, about forty miles there. So, not yeah. like they totally disappear, but they 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 do range. Okay, all right. Andy Jones asked, "Do you find feeding areas or bone yards in any of these areas?" I, I've never found a, the body of a dead skunk ape. Um, I just haven't. Uh, I, we've had a couple of thousand bears in the Everglades where I live, and I've only found one or two bears. 
Um, the majority of the area is covered with water for about mm -hmm. six to seven months out of the year. Um, we have a lot of buzzards and, and, and a lot of predators, so bones are scattered pretty rapidly. The chances of finding something intact is pretty much uh, non-existent unless it's very fresh. So I haven't, but I do find a lot of bones. I find where alligators have been killed and eaten and deer have been killed. I find where uh, Florida panthers have fought and one has died and you, you might find a bone or something, but never the bones of a skunk ape. And there was another question along with that that you asked. Was it, it was Do you find any feeding areas? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. That's a, that's a big part of, of what I do. We have pond apples here in the Everglades, which are about the size of an apple. Yeah. And there's areas, 50, 60 acres of those. They grow in the wild and they just produce tons and tons of fruit. And the last remnants of those are falling off right now. And they, and they drop from the trees and they're real sweet, juicy type of uh, fruit and uh, a main source of food for, for bears, um, deer, wild hog, raccoons, and skunk apes. Yeah, uh, also, you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I imagine there's a large variety of food sources there in the swamp for sure. Oh my! I mean that you know that that is uh, 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 just a huge topic with me. Um, yeah, a lot of people uh, in the past have said, you know, well, what would they eat? But the truth <laughs> of the matter is, is there's a lot of edible plants in the Everglades. The the Indians that adapted and lived to the Everglades, uh, they didn't farm at all. Everything was gathered from the wild. Mm -hmm many many edible plants many medicinal plants uh, yeah just uh, a lot of lots and lots i mean we could talk about that all night i could i could hit some some a few points but right it's real it gets it's really in depth it's called botany oh yeah have you tried any calls or knocks at all in the in the everglades there no i've, I've never i've never really try to do things that way i see that on some of the, the shows but i'm i'm more of a of a hunter and 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 try to keep my scent down and quiet use the wind in my favor uh, i use elevated platforms um i try to be as as stealthy as i can um I've brought people out who've, who've tried calling before, and and then I brought people out who thought that sitting and hooting and hollering around the campfire was going to work, and uh, I really haven't had any success at doing that. I, I, I'm more, um, I, I'm more trying to do them like they're, like they're the biggest, smartest buck in the woods, and that's just kind of the way I do it. Now, the, you know, even deer hunters use calls and scents, so I'm not I'm not writing that off. But I personally haven't had any success with that. Okay. Have you heard any? Have you heard any howls or calls before, out there? I yeah, I hear I hear a lot of noises in the woods. Um, um, I get a lot of audio sent to me, and um, so uh, yeah, I you, you know a, a wounded bear can make one hell of a noise, um, but a racket yeah. or pig, even even a deer make some ungodly sounds so i hear a lot of sounds i haven't been able to pinpoint any particular sound that i can say that's what i'm hearing but i there is an unusual sound that that i i i, I, I found sign you know in the areas when i've searched them and it, yeah. it's not a loud growl or or a holler it's it's more of a cooing sound like a deep drone like, whoa. but it just carries. I mean, it, that's very I just like whoa. But if you can imagine that carrying for miles and rumbling through the trees, and but it's not loud. It's kind of a kind of rumble sound, and mm -hmm. uh, it carries for miles. And I and I I've heard it, and, I, and then I've heard where I'll hear that and, and, and see we were looking at a hammock that the 
Skunk Ape came out of, which is relatively small, maybe a quarter half a mile long. The, our swamps are are 20, 30 miles long. So I can stand in the grasslands uh, out and look at a swamp that pretty much goes to infinity to the south and to the north. And I've heard those sounds throughout the swamp in different areas at one time. Uh, so it's definitely some type of animal communicating, not an alligator. Alligators bellow, I'm familiar with that. But I have heard that low drone sound that carries. So uh, I, I think that, that I might be onto something there. And, you know, all, all animals make different sounds. So I'm sure if they do have vocalizations, that there's probably a wide range of them. Right. All right, David, we're coming up on an hour. So we're going to ask this one last question here from Hilton Whittlewood. In your opinion, what do you think they think of humans? NQ. What do you think they think of us? I, you know, I, I, I would think that they think that we're, a, you know, a, a threat. I'm not, I'm like a, just like a, any other animal, any other wild animal would. Yeah. Um, they, they would tend to shy away from from groups and apparently do because you don't hear them walk about walk into the up to the grocery store. I mean, they just uh, so they they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna stay stay away. Um, a lot of the areas that I'm in, nobody stepped foot in in 30, 40 years. I and I I want to talk about this just for a minute because I don't you know I don't know if people really um, that that haven't been down here. Do we have a minute? Oh, oh yeah. Really? Okay. Um, I spend a lot of time, and um, and when I say that, I, I don't just spend a couple of weekends out every month. And ever, I'm in the Everglades every day. I'm in the Everglades. This summer, I spent over a thousand hours in the night in the Everglades. Um, almost. Almost every night I'm out, I cover tremendous amounts of ground, maybe 10, 10, 12 miles a night. It was a little drier than normal this year, and it was a lot hotter than normal. So um, I, I, I go out during the day, but this year I, I did nights. And um, several times I had giant sharks come in on me. And people, a lot of people don't think about sharks being in the Everglades, but they are. I'm back in the in the edge of the park by the 10,000 islands, and, and I may wade all night long in water above my knees. And so I have sharks coming at me. Um, we have crocodiles here. I had several crocodiles come up on me, big ones. And uh, so it's just, uh, it, it's, and we have poisonous snakes. We have a million alligators, which I'm familiar. I own, if you were watching the videos, I own a, some pretty massive alligators. I don't trust them. Yeah. They're my, they're, they're my, they're my property, but it's a very dangerous area. And several times this year, I came very close to death in so many ways. And, um, and I, and, and, and that's just part of, of, of research that I do. And people ask, Oh, can I come along with you, Dave? Let's go. I want to go, I want to go skunk ape hunting with you tonight. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not, it's not no glamorous job. We have some serious bugs here. Uh, I could be in mud up over my knees for two or three hours in mangrove roots. And, and unless you're, you're, you know, normal people can't keep up. But I'm not saying, I, I did have a guy from Michigan a couple years ago who came down and just amazed me. He was with me, he was there, he caught on quick and he made it happen. But it's not something that, that it's not, it, going out into the Everglades like I do is not something that should be done without using caution because it's really treacherous. I'm not kidding. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, I, I caught the second largest snake in the world. It was getting ready to bite me in the face. I have it now <laughs> in captivity. Um, it's, uh, it, I tell my son, I say, listen, if I don't come out of the woods, if you, if I go into the woods and I don't come out, 
I went the way I want to go, and I don't want you to worry about it, because they'll never find my body. I will not be found. Right. Uh, it's, it's no joke. So you my, got alone? You got alone? Yes, I did. Hmm. I went with um, uh, uh, a Seminole Indian um, uh, three or four nights ago. I was invited by the by the Seminole tribe to the reservation, and I we went. Me and this older elder Indian went out, and he was going to show me show me around where the Indians had been having some sightings. And that was a really big opportunity. I'm really blessed that I have that kind of relationship. We set up camp, and um, he uh, he knew some plants, and he made some type of Indian medicine. He sprinkled around the trees. About that time, it started raining, and and we got five inches of rain, and the whole and we were in a, a low area, and the, the water came up overnight. Or somehow we survived. I guess he put down some good medicine, but only a couple miles away, they had to call in the helicopter and um, airlift some people out of the park south of the reservation so I, I get into some pretty rough situations for me it was just another night in the swamp <laughs> but for the people south of us it was a little more than they wanted to deal with yeah oh i can imagine i i don't think i could make it over an hour in there <laughs> <laughs> they had chili they had chili and, for you larry there's Eagle. better times to visit the glades too if you come down march and april and I tell yeah. people that, hey, come down in March and April. That's when it's beautiful. But most people don't. They think, well, I'll just go down there whenever, October, July. And it, and it gets a little harsh. I can imagine. Definitely. Well, David, we appreciate you coming on tonight. We know you had to go through a little bit of trouble to join us, but we do greatly appreciate, appreciate that. It. Do you have any final thoughts, any upcoming events or anything you want to talk about? No, I, I have a roots festival at the park, which is, is roots meaning uh, roots culture, and um, and it's it's a big event. Um, but we're not doing it this year because of the COVID. Um, it's just uh, a little more than we don't want to go and uh, promote it, and then here after the first of the year have everything shut down. So we don't really have any events going on. Yeah. Um, I have a website, skunkape.info. People want to kind of get an idea of what goes on at my place. There's a bunch of links on it. You can look around and see. And 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 all I can say is um, that if there's that to people that that might doubt, you know, because you you get that in this. But we, these skunk apes are real here in Everglades. They do exist. And and to to take that lightly or to just say no there's no way um is really put in a species at risk and needlessly and i just would like for people to think about that definitely so i mean there's hundreds of encounters every year down there talking about road crossings face to face in the woods and everything else so it's definitely something that people need to pay attention to well, Scott, you made it through the show. I did. I did. Well, this is this is one I I know I probably won't go watch again because I'm on it, and I don't <laughs> I don't want to look at myself. <laughs> well, you're in the limelight well, we now. <laughs> but we appreciate Dave David coming on here. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I've been down to uh, uh, Miyaka State State Park and, and been through there, so I was kind of familiar with what David was talking about as far as that that climate and the, the palmettos and the, and the palm trees and, and stuff like that. And it is, is a harsh environment. I mean, you get off, you know, into the, the swamp area and there's something that wants to kill you. Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. for sh that's, that's for sure. Um, but, but also, um, you know, I was noticing that little logo up there ab above my, b above my shoulder it reminded me about the, uh, the, uh, the, the, beast t-shirts i know that uh i need to pick up one for uh for the meet and greet and uh, i was looking at the coffee cup so make sure you visit that and uh help out help out the show because it's lots of little nice little christmas gifts to get yeah. that's for sure perfect 
Well, we appreciate everybody's time tonight. David, we definitely appreciate you joining us. And I hope to get down there and visit you sometime at your research center and see what all you've got in there. If you do, and I'll, if you could bring me one of those shirts, I'll get you some skunk ape gear and send right. back to you. <laughs> That's I a just good deal. I show with Fox News up in my act as well. That I don't, I don't know the area. It's called Fox Nation. I don't know. Yeah. And then I'll be on the, um, I'll be on the History Channel sometime in the next couple of weeks. Um, pair, pair, the proof is out there. I think it's called the proof. Yeah. Is out there. Uh, should right. be interested in it. This wasn't my best interview. I mean, I'm in good spirits, but I don't know. I just feel like I like I could have maybe hit on some more. There's so much to talk about, so maybe we'll do it again sometime. If y'all feel like you'd like to, that sounds great. We'd love to. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Well, thanks for everybody joining us in the chat. And if y'all have any questions for David, y'all can find him on Facebook or go visit his research center down in the Everglades. We'll come Thank back you. and do this again next Thursday. Thanks everybody for joining us. See y'all. Beast TV would like to welcome all of our new Facebook members. Be sure to check out our pictures and videos of possible evidence. And if you haven't checked out the files tab, there is a wealth of information that you may find beneficial. If you would like to support Beast TV, check out our gear. We have coffee mugs, face masks, gaiters, shirts, and tank tops. The link is pinned at the top of the comment section. Everything is always marked down 20%. So, come check out our junk. We want to thank all of our new subscribers and our faithful followers. Also, be sure to check out our field evidence videos and our sister channel, Beast of the Woods. That's Larry's channel. If you want to help us out, make sure that you are subscribed. Click the thumbs up button, ring the bell, and leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. Thanks again to each of you for watching, and we will see you again. Same bat time, same bat channel. Night, night, footers. This has been a Sawdust Production.